This is Miao Wang. I am a software engineer working on Android Neural Networks API at Google. Today, I'm happy to talk about how to accelerate ML inferences on mobile devices with the help of Android Neural Networks API. Slide 2. This talk will cover the following topics. What is an API? The current features of an API. The performance and power impact if you are using an API. And how to use an API. Slide 3. So first of all, what is an API? Slide 4. As the name suggests, an API is intended to run neural networks inferences on hardware accelerators. An API is a C API. We choose to use C API mainly because they are having stable interfaces and can easily be used by higher level programming languages like Java and machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow Lite and PyTorch Mobile. As we all know, ML area is evolving fast. There are new concepts, operators, and data types continuously coming out. All these requires an API also able to evolve fast. Additionally, since the closer to the method, the harder it is to evolve. We want to make sure existing models and use cases can run well on old and new hardware. So backward compatibility is also important to an API. Here is a brief history of an API. An API 1.0 was introduced with Android OMR1. It had 29 operators, supports FP32, and asymmetric quantization. And with Android P, we added a bunch of new operators. With Android Q, there are a lot more operators added, and we started to support FP16 and signed per channel quantization. And additionally, developers can use the introspection API to query the available accelerators on the device and choose which accelerators to use to run the inferences. Also, vendors can use a vendor extension mechanism to add additional functionality to an API. With a soon-to-be-released Android R, we added more operators. We started to support signed asymmetric quantization. Also, there are advanced features like control flow, quality of service, memory domain, and asynchronous command queue being supported. We also made an API runtime to be an updatable Apex module, which means we are able to update the runtime much faster than the normal Android update schedule. Slide 5. The key objective of an API is to make inferences run fast and efficiently on as many devices as possible. In order to achieve that, we need to make sure that the inferences running through an API can run on the accelerators available on the device. How did they achieve that? Slide 6. Here is a high-level overview of the architecture of an API. You can find two important interfaces defined by an API in this architecture, the NDK API interface and the hardware abstraction, the how layer. Application developers can use the NDK API to interact with an API runtime, likely through ML frameworks like PyTorch Mobile, TensorFlow Lite. I'll talk more about the NDK interface in the how to use an API section. Hardware vendors implement the NAPI how interface, which allows an API runtime to discover available hardware accelerators and interact with them. The how is versioned and backward compatible, similar to the NDK interfaces. Currently, there are many accelerators already implementing an API how. That's including the GPU, the DSP, the TPU, and the NPU, etc., from various hardware vendors and IP providers. The NAPI runtime is responsible for validating the request from the application, managing the memory, distributing workload to available accelerators, and it is in charge of interacting with other components in the Android OS. You can find more information about the architecture in the link on the side. Slide 7. So let's talk about some performance and power numbers. As I mentioned earlier, the key objective of an API is to make inferences run fast and efficiently. Both performance and power consumption are important for the user experience on mobile devices. Slide 8. Here is a slide that's showing the numbers of running Google Lens OCR model on Pixel 4 when we are shipping Android Q last year. So we can see that an API path is 3x the performance of the optimized CPU kernel of TF Lite. It also uses 3.7x less power, which is critical in this particular use case. Additionally, 
the whole model runs on the DSP instead of the CPU, which frees up the CPU resources for other workload that if needed. Slide 9. We can see similarly great improvements for models running on other different SOCs. Here is an example of running ML kit face detection model on the device with MediaTek P90 SOC. As we know, ML is evolving fast, and there are more and more models running on the mobile devices. And different models running on different devices may show different characteristics on performance. So we are continually working hard to optimize the software layers and introduce new features to make inferences faster. Slash 10. Now, in order to get all the performance gains, we need to know how to use an API. Let's talk about that. Slash 11. Well, due to the limited time of this talk, I can only briefly talk about different ways of using an API. For detailed tutorials and documentations, especially for the advanced features, please refer to the links on the slides. First of all, the developers can use an API directly. All the API functions and types are started with a neural networks. And the general workflow of the code is something like the below. Well, we first create and define the compute graph. We call it the neural networks model. And then we can create the compilation object, which is a neural networks compilation from the model. And after we created the compilation object, we can then create execution object from the compilation object to run and manage each individual inferences. Well, but all this involves lots of boilerplate code if you want to make sure like the whole model is being uh, implemented in an API directly. So there is an easier way to use an API that's via the machine learning frameworks like PyTorch Mobile, TensorFlow Lite. You can also use an API with other high-level APIs like WebNN. If you are using TensorFlow Lite, there are a couple of lines of change to enable an API delegate, which can automatically detect the supported operations and run the supported operations through an API. So that's 12. That's all I have for today. Thanks a lot, and let me know if you have any questions.